Okay, it looks like we have uh, most of the line in here, and it looks like we've got all the... the okay, so we've got all the seats full. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, that way we won't have to go too much too long today, and we'll try to fit everything in. Welcome to everybody. Uh, who all has had the wonderful opportunity to have been up all night trying to figure out how to get your neutron going? You know, I mean, which one? I was up half last night doing that myself, so I can sympathize with that. Um, you know, you, you spent these hours of getting your OpenStack installation up and running. You spin up your first VM. And guess what? No IP. What happened? So let's, we're going to talk about that. We're going to show you what to do. We're going to show you how to troubleshoot. In fact, what we're going to do is I, this is supposed to be a hands-on seminar, but the problem we've had is the Wi-Fi has been up and down uh, this hour leading up into this. I don't know whether it'll be up and down, so it's going to probably be impossible to try to have you all log into the instances. So I'll walk through and show you how to do it. And uh, I took the precaution of making sure I had VMs running local on my laptop so I didn't have to rely on Wi-Fi just so we could get around it, which is why I was up half last night. You know, I get installation half done, and then all of a sudden Nova says it can't find an image, and Neutron doesn't want to. So let's look at that. Let's talk about what's going on. But let me introduce myself. My name is Phil Hopkins. I'm a principal engineer at Rackspace, and I contribute a bit to uh, documentation, uh, Neutron. Uh, how many of you have all read the OpenStack networking manual? Hopefully everybody's at least seen it. Good. That, uh, I helped write that. I can, a uh, small part of it. Uh, there's another racker uh, by the name of Matt Casawara that helped write a whole lot of that. And if you get into the documentation IRC channel, you can see him as Sam-I-M, and you can ask him questions, as well as my handle in the IRC is Phil underscore H. Um, I have uh, some other folks working with me. John McKenzie over in the, uh, uh, my, my right, uh, yeah, my right, your left. Uh, there's a couple other rackers that will be in and out here. If we can get, pull off some hands-on towards the end, we'll try to do that. Uh, uh, Matt Dorn and Byron McCollum, who are also from Rackspace, that we go, we've had the opportunity of going around the world teaching OpenStack to the world, and I go around the world teaching Neutron to the world in a Neutron class. So let's talk about Neutron, because it's one of those fun things that we all get into, and like we said, we've all had the uh, fun of working with. One of the comments I'd like to start out with is that how many of you folks consider yourself Linux admins or Linux skilled, knowledgeable? Now how many of you consider yourself network engineers? Uh, yeah, a lot fewer hands. And here's what we've got to talk about here, is that you Linux folks, See, I used to work, I've also worked as a Cisco admin from time to time. I've done, I've taught Cisco networking classes in the past. So I have a fairly strong networking background along with a very strong uh, Linux background. So it gives me the best of both worlds. The problem we find is that we have lots of folks coming into Neutron, need to make the networking, and they're, they're typically Linux folks. And we Linux folks all think we know networking, but if I, if I gave everybody a quiz right now, tell me how many packets occur to get, for a machine to get its IP using DHCP, and what type of packets go out, each of those are. How many, how many of you think it could tell me successfully? Yeah, you see, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> Not many hands go up. So this is the point, is that we need to understand the networking. And so I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the networking stack, and then we'll look at what happens when Neutron doesn't work. So the point being, as we look at this, is that you need to understand and go back to your networking 101. Get the networking basics down. Go. The slides be available? Uh, um, do we have those up? Uh, we'll make them available here. Uh, there, I think uh, one of our gentlemen has it on a URL that I'll post at the end. If not, we'll, we'll make sure that they're up and available. Because there, there's tw not many slides, but yeah, we'll make sure you can get a hold of these. Good point, and uh, yeah, I'll figure out how to get it out where you can find them. Bottom line is that the networking stack is important, and in the Neutron world, we're actually focusing at the bottom four layers of that stack. 
In other words, layers one, two, three, and kind of three and four are, are kind of interrelated. That's where all our focus is. And it's what you need to know is how this works. And you need to know in detail. So this is a problem, is that we kind of know, but then the specifics we don't, and that's what gets us in trouble. How do we figure out what goes on? How many of you think that TCP dump is your friend and ally? If you're a neutron folk, you gotta get your hand up high and you need to know how to use it well because this is your way of finding out what's going on. But this, this uh, OSI model, you need to know and you need to know what's going on at the various levels. You need to know what happens for, what type of packets is our request. We need to have this type of networking detail and I urge everybody, if you're getting into Neutron, if you haven't done it in a while, it'd probably be worth going back taking a networking 101 class just as a refresher. I don't have time to go through all that detail here, but it's critical that you understand that. Because as we get into Neutron, as we get into what happens, one of the things is that we need to segment traffic. We have the issues of scalability. You know, we're trying to put up clouds that may have 50, 100, several hundreds of tenants and, and networks, and all this needs to be separate. We want to make each tenant gets in there, needs to th think that they're the only world in town when they're on our cloud. They can't see everybody else's. So we need this traffic isolation. We've been doing things like that for years. We use uh, concepts called network overlays. And really that's all this is, is a type of network overlay that we use to segment it. And there's a couple choices we have. We can use VLANs, and we use that quite a bit in Neutron, or we can use tunnels, GRE or VXLAN tunnels. We can use those for overlays to segment. The problem of VLANs is how many VLANs can you do? Well, you have, what, 12 bits there? What? How many bits? Okay, this is, the, I, I have to make sure everybody understands. There's 4096. Okay, I think that's, that's a little more than 12 bits, isn't it? But anyway, uh, it's, it's in that range, it's 4096 VLANs. And any reasonable sized cloud, we can easily exceed that. So then we have to use the technology such as tunneling using GRE or VXLAN. So understanding how these technologies work is critical. VLANs are layer two implementation. In fact, in the normal frame, the framing portion of it, not the IP portion, but the framing portion, is a section that we can do VLAN tagging to separate. And we use this all the time in our networks. In fact, we set our switches up. So when we plug our machines into the switch, we only get the traffic that's on the VLAN that we're on. We don't see everybody else's traffic. We use that for security to separate. It's a whole lot easier to, to manage a, uh, a number of smaller broadcast domains than one huge flat domain for an admin. And we set this. So we've used this for years, but we have the 4096 limit. The other technologies that we can use are tunnels, and these are fairly new to a lot of us. We don't understand or are, are we familiar with it. Both of these basically take the previous packet that we had and wrap a header around it, whether they're using GRE headers or VXLAN headers. Guess what? That presents a little problem. We now present to our framing layer potentially a packet that can be bigger than the MTU that we have. If, if the bottom level packet coming is 1,500 bytes and then we want to wrap, for example, a GRE header of additional 50 bytes, we got a potential packet of 1,550. That's a problem. You can't route those packets. So now we got to do things like setting our MTUs down so we don't get ourselves into, into trouble there. It's things that we have to think about what's going on. And so both VXLANs and GRE have this issue that you have to think about and plan ahead of time. You've got to make sure that your v, VMs have MTUs small enough. The other thing is there's something that should take care of it called PMTUD, which is path MTU discovery, which allows machines that have smaller MTUs to uh, talk to ones that have bigger ones. The ones with bigger ones will send a bigger packet. And if everything's set up right, then that packet gets dropped, but the place where it gets dropped with a smaller MTU will send a ICMP packet of a type that sells the originator, the packet it receives is too big, it should dial down and resend a, a new packet until it finds and gets it through. Of course, then you get the admin that's gonna be 
keep his gateway real secure by dropping all ISAMP traffic, and guess what? They just broke the net for you. And so it's things like that you have to understand that can break things very subtly and in some ways that cause all sorts of difficulty here. So both of these have some different technologies. V VXLANs, like this talks about, uses something that actually is MAC and user diagram protocol. So it actually talks to a VTEP, what we call virtual um, term, a VXLAN terminal endpoint, if I can get the terminology out here, which listens on a particular uh, port. And oh, here's another wonderful thing that gets out is when Linux implemented its VXLAN plugin, there was no standard. So it uses a port by default of about 8,000. Since that happened, IANA has set a port in the 4,000 range for VXLAN. So guess what? If you load the Linux kernel VXLAN tunnel without changing the port when you load it, VXLAN's not going to work. So now if I try to use mixed OVS, Open vSwitch, and Linux Bridge technologies, and I don't fix that on my Linux Bridge side, guess what? Things don't work. It's these type of things, and knowing how to find them out is what you have to learn. This is why I talk about networking 101 is critical to, to understanding how things work. And knowing how to read a TCP dump trail is going to be critical to finding out what happens here, as we'll see in a few minutes here. So Linux networking. We need to understand all the tools. All you network folks that raised your hand, how many of you are skilled at Linux command line? Because you need to be that. The issue here is to troubleshoot Neutron, you've got to be skilled in both worlds. Not just the networking world or Linux world, you've got to be able to marry the both. And the things you have to understand, for example, is like the next one. How does the traffic, network traffic, go through the kernel? We have things like IP table rules. In fact, if you look at open vSwitch environment on a compute node, you see that the traffic, the TAP interface, goes out into Linux bridge and goes into, into another vth pair into open vSwitch. You wonder who came up with this it looks like Rube Goldberg. For you folks that are English speakers, you understand who I'm talking about. You folks from other countries may not understand Rube Goldberg, but he was an artist and other things from back in the, I think, 1930s type. And he'd come up with these machines that were, you wanted to go light a candle over here instead of just walking over the match. He'd have a contraption with things falling over and you just wonder how it ever happened. Eventually the, the candle got lit. But, and, you look at the neutron layout, sometimes it feels like that. But there's a specific reason. It's because we need to do security group rules and we need to filter traffic immediately as it comes in and goes out of a VM. You do not want a VM out there that somebody's broken into it, now spoofing MAC addresses to make bad things happen in your network environment. And so we apply security group rules on the traffic Immediately as it comes out of a VM, if you spoof the MAC address, you know that's what's going to happen next on that packet? It's going to go to the bit bucket. We're not going to let it go. We're not going to let you change your IP on an interface. or your, We assigned it. You don't get to change it from OpenStack viewpoint. And that's why we have that Linux bridge right here is because of this, of what the flow table. We have to move from one user space program to another user sp space program, and we have to get the packets through IP tables, so we can filter them. And so we use the Linux bridge so that they will go through the forward table and we can filter the packets. So it's understanding also how the IP table rules and how the network traffic goes to the kernel is critical to also to understanding where you can lose packets and where things can go wrong. If we look at TAP interfaces, we build a tap interface. A tap interface is what we plug into a VM, and the traffic from our NIC and our VM comes out this tap interface into our, out of our user land program. And so it's basically, as it says, a layer two virtual internet, ethernet device that we use. The VM will view that as a normal NIC card. It thinks it has a NIC card, and the system does that. And we use that to send data to other user space programs. In this case, like I mentioned, in the case of Neutron, we plug it into a Linux bridge so we can filter, tr filter traffic through IP table rules right on that Linux bridge. Another terminology you need to understand in the Linux world is bridges. 
Now, from a networking viewpoint, we all understand what a bridge is. We plug things into a bridge, it's like a hub, and traffic goes in, gets reflected out to everybody, and there's no filtering. Well, a Linux bridge is, is not quite like that. It's really, I, I put it connect with, uh, more like when we have an unmanaged switch, and it does MAC address learning. So it only sends packets out the interface based on MAC addresses. It's not sent it everywhere. It's, it's a smarter device than a simple bridge. And so we use bridges all over the place inside of Neutron. And it's important to spend time studying and understand that. So understand how they work. And as it points out here, you really need in a Neutron on your compute node and on your network node, wherever that sits, or your network functionality, you need bridge utilities installed. So if you're running Ubuntu, it's at git install bridge utilities, it's yum install and the Red Hat version of bridge utilities. I think that package is the same name in both environments. You need that installed. It should install by dependencies, but sometimes it doesn't get there. And if you don't get bridge utilities, you can't build your bridges, and so your Neutron gets broken. So it's a package you need to know, and it's important to understand. Because the other thing is we'll do is use something we call VETH pairs, virtual Ethernet pairs. We create those. These are like having two layer two NIC cards, if you please, connected with a cable. If I put a packet in on one VETH pair, it comes out on the other end. And so it just basically connects two. And we use this as a virtual path cable. A patch cable, like it says. That way I can connect to my Linux bridge and open vSwitch. I can do, for example, that way. So I can connect between things, between kernel space and user space or different, different functionality that goes on. So understanding how VETH pairs work, they're actually quite easy to uh, build. And when I teach a class, we actually have a lab where we go in and manually create and connect wire up some uh, systems using VETH pairs and VXLAN tunnels and let you do it, see how to do it manually. It's something to learn how to do because if you know how to do it, you can then know how to just troubleshoot and see what's going on inside your machine here. The other terminology we all need to know is network namespaces. Something that's fairly new, it's come about in the last several years. Network namespaces are very important. They're critical to making Neutron work because inside a network namespace, it's like being in its own little world. From a network stack viewpoint, it only sees the stuff inside its namespace. And it's how, for example, who wants to have to go give each tenant tell them what IP ranges they can use? I don't want to do that. I don't think any of us want to do it. Allow us to use overlapping IP so tenants can have the same IP range and keep them separate. We put endpoints inside the namespaces so that things stay isolated. This idea, like it says, is similar to a CH root environment for a network stack. And inside, each of it has its own route tables, has its own IP addresses, its network devices. It's totally segmented and separate from anything else. So I can put a VETH, one end of a VETH pair inside a network namespace and terminate to have things happen for a router or DHCP service running inside that namespace. And it won't see the other ones that are running inside other network namespaces. So we don't have time to go more deeply into this, but these are important things to run and to know about. I have a question for you Linux folks. What command do you use when you go try to find the IP address of your Ethernet card? Who said I have config? Who, raise your hands. Come on. I heard it out there. Okay. All you that did that, take, which, if you're right-handed, you just take that right hand and said, don't do that anymore. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, we should know by this is that those commands have been deprecated. I have conf config could go away at any time. There is a new set of commands that came with the IP route 2 stack that came out. And these are the IP commands. And they have the ability to allow us to do lots of other important, powerful things. Now I'll tell you a little aside. The IP route command, its output I don't like, the format. I like the route command, and I still use it. So anyway, because um, I don't like it. But for example, IP neighbor replaces ARP. And IP neighbor gives you information you'll never get with the ARP command. Like the status of whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, reachable or whether it's gone static, stale, what type. By the way, how, if, if I... How long does something stay in an active state versus a stale state? 
and how long is it kept in the ARP table? These are things that we should know. It's active for a minute, it's in the ARP table for five minutes. And so that four minute thing that's called stale, we treat it like it was recently used, we treat it like it's an active one. However, if we treat it like an active one and we don't get a response in a certain time period, then we can send an ARP request. And so those, those are handled a little different than an active. And the system handles it. So understanding how these, hap how these uh, are used and how we can use them, uh, creating the IP neighbor to look at ARP, IP tunnel to create tunnels. Uh, and oh, by the way, there's one command. Uh, I'll give you a tidbit that you try to find the documentation in this because it doesn't exist. There is a dash D flag with IP. The only time you ever see it documented, if you do an IP help or IP dash H, you'll see that it says there's a D flag that says details. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'll go to the man page. No, well, it doesn't tell any, say anything about a D flag. You don't find any documentation. If I have a interface that was built as like a sub-interface for VXLAN or VLAN or GRE tunnel, how do you know what the tunnel key is or, G, or the VXLAN ID or the VLAN ID is? Well, unless I made the interface with that built into the name, you won't know. But if you run an IP space dash D space link space show and then the interface name, and I'll show you this when we get to it, you'll actually be able to see that. You'll see that information. It's the only way I know how to find that. And oh, well, and oh by the way, it's not documented anywhere that it does that. So that's, that's one of these joys of uh, the Linux world here. The other command that you have to understand how to use in troubleshooting Neutron is the TCP dump command. You've got to be able to use, this is your to, magic tool. This is where you find out where things go and don't go, where packets happen and don't happen. It's a packet analyzer tool. And the one nice thing is that I don't understand where all the bits in a packet, I can go, I know where to go look it up if I have to, but that's painful. I'd rather do a, save as a PCAP and let this wonderful tool called Wireshark do it for me. Because I know when Wireshark does it, it gets it right every time. And if I got to go figure all those bits and bytes out, my math is bad enough, I get it wrong half the time. So using the automated tools is wonderful. And use them. You can use Wireshark to help you uh, if you're having trouble find out understanding. And if the person that wrote this tool is in the room, I'd like to hug them or at least shake their hand or do something. If you're not familiar with it, easy OVS. Because if you've twisted your way around OVS flow table and try to figure those out every once in a while, uh, you'll love this tool. Now it has a little quirks and it could be maintained a little better and you install it, you gotta watch out, it can do some funny things to your environment. But if you get it out there running, we'll use it here and we'll look at it in a few minutes. This one is a lifesaver because it puts the flow tables in a much more readable format. And oh, by the way, in, if you've ever done a dump flow tables with open vSwitch, you notice it says out port one. What? Port one. Oh, I gotta go over here and look in this thing to figure out and look through what port one is. This one tells you that, oh, port one is a patch cable and it puts it in there, so it fixes all that for you and does that very nicely. So it's a handy tool. It's really powerful and very useful. Let's talk about Neutron for a few minutes and then we're gonna look at a real life scenario of what can happen. And we'll troubleshoot uh, and look through that. First off, understand the key neutron, neutron pieces. You have the Neutron API server. That's a server that runs on, a, on, on your controller nodes or node. We also, the server uses a database for persistency and it talks to all of its components through our messaging uh, queue. Typically we're all using RabbitMQ, but you could be, there's several zero MQ and there, there's several other ones, uh, Cupid and others that people use from time to time. And then we'll have a plugin agent, Linux Bridge or Open vSwitch or some others out there we'll be using. And then we'll typically run a DHCP agent and L3 agent, and they might be more than one of those out there that we have running, that they all talk through this messaging queue to each other. We need to understand those. We also need to understand the magic terminology that Neutron uses. If you look up in the networking manual and in, in the Neutron book there, 
in the OpenStack documentation, it tells us that a network is an isolated segment analogous to VLAN. I say that's baloney. Basically, when I create a network in OpenStack, it's a placeholder into which I can plug subnets. So I create something I call a network, it's a name, and in that, then I'll create subnets that I plug into my network. And then to route between subnets, I have to create routers, and I'll have to have those type things. Every time I plug a VM, a DHCP server, or router into a subnet, they use something we call a port. And this is, like it says, is a connection point. And so we can have these connection points. You ever get to where you try to delete a network and it says it won't do it because there's still ports. Somehow something didn't get deleted. So I have to go manually do a neutron port list, see the ports on that network, and, and maybe start having to make sure I deleted all the VMs or if, if something didn't clean up properly, I have to manually delete the ports before I can delete the network. And so we have the ports out there. These are connection blocks. Now, if you're trying to learn Neutron or Troubleshoot, let me give you a suggestion to make your life easier. Start out with a Linux bridge version of it and get that working and understand that before you go try doing open vSwitch. In fact, from experience in years past, our uh, Rackspace private cloud group in production, we still only use Linux bridge versions because uh, back uh, up to uh, about a year ago, the versions of Open vSwitch that were being used in Ubuntu and Re uh, Red Hat <coughs> were the version one, and they had serious reliability problems. And rather than have our customers have problems like kernel panics, because when the Open vSwitch kernel module plugged into causing kernel panics, that doesn't make anybody happy when their cloud goes down because of that, we started using Linux Bridge. At some point in time, we'll probably go back to using Open vSwitch. It's finally, at, at version 2, getting what I call relatively stable and seems to be much better. But uh, if you're trying to learn it, learn how the Linux bridge so you don't have to deal with flow tables. It's much easier and more sensible. Because here's the problem that leads to the next slide. This eye chart that I have up here is the Open vSwitch version of it. And you can see over there the, in the top far right hand side of that, uh, or my right hand, your left hand, we'll get this right. The instance that go, has to go through the Linux bridge, goes to open vSwitch, it then goes into the bridge, that's the integration bridge it goes, gets hooked to the patch cable to the tunnel bridge, and then it will be put out in the wire to either going to another VM on a different node or into the DHCP or router namespace that would be on the network node. And in the network node, you have a similar thing, a tunnel bridge, uh, integration bridge, and VETH pairs that hook this all together. And tracing through that can be a bit of a pain. The other choice is what I call a bit simpler is the Linux bridge version. In this case, you see two compute nodes. Basically, the instance is plugged straight into a Linux bridge, no open vSwitch, no flow tables to deal with, and VXLAN or VLAN or GRE tunnel implementations. These drawings are taken straight out of the networking book, so if you want to use that to refer to the OpenStat networking guide, that is your handy, handy dandy decoder ring for a lot of this, and I recommend you spend, uh, get close to it and familiar with it. So with that said, those, this, these are the flows, and I know everybody's got these two uh, diagrams etched in their memory right now, so we can go through and start troubleshooting. Uh, fortunately, I do know them, so I can talk you through it. So we'll look at this. I'm going to bring up here uh, in just a second. So let's look at some nightmare scenarios. I'm going to go online here. I've got some local VMs, and um, we'll look at at the end of the class. If there's some time, we'll get some hands-on, but I don't know how the Wi-Fi is still doing in here. So let's look at what happens. Let me bring up, and I have right here, let me bring over the screen. Unfortunately, I can't make this any bigger. I've got a VM here, so let me log into it. This is, I just use a simple Cirrus. Uh, trust me, when I get into the command line, it'll be where you can read it. But this one, uh, um, let me get things going here. Okay, let's go there and let's log into it. I always make the comment, I, 
I'd like to meet the person that wrote the, has done the Cirrus image because um, somehow they, they apparently must be a baseball fan and it's come true again. The password in there is Cub, Cubs win and anybody that's a Cubs fan is doomed to a life of agony and pain, I think. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who know American baseball there. Oh, so, so we're in there. So let's do an IPA and, and let's see our, uh-oh. We spun up our VM. And how many of you been up all night trying to get this? And, and you get your VM up and you see exactly that. What are we missing? We don't have an IP address on our interface. In fact, if I try to do if up, guess what's going to happen? DHCP, I bet, is going to fail. So let's try this. Let's do a sudo. I'm going to che cheat here and become root. And let's just run the UDHCP command. If I can uh, type here. And that will go off and start sending packets. And sure enough, it says to send discover packets out there. And so what's, what kind of packets is, is it sending out? Well, GHCP is a broadcast. It's a layer two broadcast packet. So it's going out to everybody and it communicates on also on uh, the IP ports 67 and 68. So it's doing this, but this is, a, this is a layer two broadcast. It's looking for a server. Okay, we clearly aren't getting IP and we've all seen this, we've been up. So let me go and let's get my window here and I'll go over to the compute node here. Let's bring up the compute node and let's do an IPA. Let's look at that. <laughs> and I actually have one working here. Okay, so I do an IPA on my compute node and I can see that down there interface 24 is a tap interface. Well, I know that's gonna be my interface for my VM. So let's just go make sure as we troubleshoot this thing, let's go grab this tap interface number and let's run TCP dump on it and see if we see the packets come out of our VM. So we're a good place to start, right? So I'm gonna do a, do a TCP dump. I always like to do a dash E, which gives me the layer. Uh, and yes, I know you folks in the back can't see, so let me uh, pull this up a little higher here. And then I'll do a dash I, and then I'll paste that in there, that tap, and let's let it run here. Okay, and then when I pulled that up, I got this out. Let's get this down here so we can watch what's happening. And we'll see this thing here in just a second. It will start sending some more DHCP packets out there, and we should see them come in here in just a second. And if I want to make it happen quicker, I can control C that, and just up arrow and start it. And sure enough, I see packets coming out. And those look like... DHCP request packets, don't they? We see a from a one MAC address to a, a broadcast of FFFFF address, and we can see it went from port 68 to a broadcast on port 67. But we're missing something. We see them going out, but nothing's coming back. Uh, we've been there before. So let's try something here. We see these going out. Well, Let's take a look at op Open vSwitch and let's see what's happening inside Open vSwitch. And I know we've all done this. You run this. We run that and we see all this and what is all that garbage there? We all spent hours trying to figure out what all that means. Let's try something else here. Let's look at it another way here. I'm going to easy OVS here, and I got a nice green screen here. So let's try dump. Let's look at the tunnel bridge here, just for a thing here. And this gives a nice blue here, and if I go slide up to the top of the output there, we can talk down through it and see what happened here. And you can see the columns. You can see in green here, that says the, uh, on my left or your rightmost column is an ID number, so a rule number ID. And then we get a packet count number, and then we get the next column is a table number. And then we start seeing uh, the rules in here. Uh, next actually is the uh, priority level. And then we finally see the rule. And you see the various fir first rule says come in port, the GRE port, and it's resubmitted into table three. 
And you can see the second rule says if it came in the port, the, pa the, the patch INT, so it came from the patch cable from the integration bridge, that get resubmit to two. And you can see here that the first rule has had 40 packets match. The second rule has had 142. So we can see the packets and we can go down through this and see the different packet numbers as they've matched the different rules here and different flow table rules. So let me get over here and we've got some packets going through there I see from the bottom so so we can go through this. So let's go notice some rules that learn has a 38 and uh, the bottom rule has a six, uh, 65 packets. So if we go let's just run this again and see if we get some different numbers. Sure enough, the very bottom rule right now, we had 60 some before, now it's got 74. So we see packets in that very bottom rule is saying that that flow table rule is gonna be output on the GRE tunnel endpoint. So that tells me that at least open vSwitch flow tables thinks it's got a packet that are matching flow table rules to the point of going out of open vSwitch. So wherever we're broke, it's not broke right here on my compute node. Packets are going out, and sure enough, if I go into, I can also do an exit out of here, and if I do a TCP dump, uh, do a dash N, I'll do a dash E and dash I, and uh, my VE5 on that is my, is my uh, data path, in, in this particular environment. So if I sit and look at that, and we can look at inside at the very bottom here and wait for just a second for a, uh, oh, we see the VXLAN packets, we see the DHCP request packs coming out of the, comp what they, this is mean is coming out of the compute node, coming out of open vSwitch, it now should be going over to the network node. So let's go over to the network no node, and let's go to the node that's running my other end of this, and I'm going to just stop that there. Let's get my other terminal. I just, just so happens I have a connection open there. Let's go over to my controller network node. And let's do an IP net. And let's just look at my network namespace. And if I grab my network namespace, let's look, look inside my network namespace here, see what's going on here. And let's do just do an IPA to see what we have inside that one. And we see a loop back, a tap in, and a tap interface. So it's a tap interface on which this is a spot onto which my uh, DHCP server is going to be listening. So let's do a TCP dump there. Let's just see if it's making it into the DHCP server. Let's start there. So if I do a TCP dump, I'm going to do a dash E, a dash N. I'm going to also give you a little magic here. If you're listening inside network namespaces, use the dash L option. Because otherwise, it buffers the data, and you'll sit there for five minutes thinking there's nothing going on, and then you do a control C to kill it, and you see all the data come out. The dash L will allow you to see the data in real time. So then I'll do a dash I, and let's paste in that tap interface, and let's let it sit there. Let's move this up here. And then while that's sitting there, we can see that over there. I'm going to kill this process on my VM and start it up again. Let's see if we can packets go through there. Oop, notice what happened. We're in the namespace. We can see we're sending discover packets out on my VM. But do we see anything coming to TCP dump? OK, so we know that the packet came off the controller board or came off the compute node. We saw it going out there, but we don't see it inside the namespace. So let's go and see what, uh, let's go back onto our controller node. Let's look and open vSwitch. So if I do a, bring up easy OVS, let's bring that up here and let's do a dump. Let's look at our tunnel bridge right here. And notice we've got a few packets that have made it through to the end of this thing. And some of these have hit other places in here. So let's look at these last set of numbers. Let's kill this. And let's restart so we get some packets go through this. It's send and discover. So if this packet was making it through open vSwitch, at this we should see the flow table counters increase, right? 
the packet counts. So now that we've seen some packets, we at least have seen a couple, three packets go through there. Let's go look into open vSwitch and run our command again. And look, if we come over here, if I can get my mouse pointer over here, and I, it's always fun working on two screens because I lose my mouse between the two screens here. But if you can look at my packet count right here, and packet count right here, none of those, this is my way out of it uh, one way, and then table three would be my other way out, uh, or table up here, if we go up here, you can go see that my, we would see that the packet counts never change between the two. Okay, so packet counts, that means that we've got a problem. Some are between open vSwitch and our compute node, packets aren't getting into it. So let's go. We, we, from there, we know that, or at least I know, because I built this, uh, VE5, VE5 should be the interface of which they came in on my controller node, should be coming into this. So let's run a TCP dump there. E dash N dash I V E T H five. Oh, well, I guess we just found our problem. What's that tell us? TCP dump can't connect there. Why? Because the interface is down. Okay, so let's, that helps out. So I'm going to do an IP link set V E T H five up. So we'll set it, let's do an IPA, and let's scroll back. Let's scroll back up here, and look at VE4 and 5, there are VE pairs we have. We can see VE5 VE is now showing up, VE4 is showing up, so we're good. Now let's go to our VM here, and oh, look what happened. It got an IP. It's already gotten its IP. Magic. So instead of being all up all night, in about half an hour, we figured out what was going on. Okay, let, that's, that's kind of neat. So let's go ahead and let's make sure we can ping our device. It's got an IP address, and then let's see if we can SSH into it. That all should work. So I'm going to come back onto my compute node where I have my network namespace here, and we can come up here at our network namespace. And let's go in here and... I don't remember what IP that machine got, so let's go look on the screen right here. It said it got uh, 10.2.0.3, so let's go ahead and see if we can ping it. I think that's what I said. That's the right IP address. Oh, and guess what? Host unreachable. I can't get through to it. Uh, what's that? So from my inside my namespace, it says it's not working, right? I can, again, look at the IP address, because it's, why is, it's saying from 10.0.2. And that's the interface of the TAP interface is sitting at 10.0.2. So let's look at here. So we were trying to ping this device here. Let's go on this one. Let's try ping 10.2. Did I get the right address? Yeah, 0 0.2. Let's see if it can ping the other end. And it's saying its network is unreachable, so let's, let's see what happened here. IPA, well, let's try, I know what happened. I did, that UDHCP didn't really uh, assign it, so let's do a if up to ETH, E0, and there. Now we get the route said. Let's try ping it again, and sure enough. So we up the interface, it got an IP, and we get our pings through. Life's good. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to SSH into our Cirrus image here and see what happens here. So if you remember, we can come back here. Let's SSH into it. We know what the username is there. Anybody ever had that happen? SSH is just hanging. It's not dropping, it's just hanging. So what's our first way of troubleshooting it? What's going on? <laughs> what? Okay, we're all trying to come up with solutions rather than let's figure out, what, let's take a look and troubleshoot. Let's gather some more data before we know what's going on. Yeah, I do know what's going on, but uh, let's gather some data. All good suggestions. 
Well, there's SSH provides this nice little flag called dash V that will show us what's going on in the SSH protocol. Now, notice we get all these things. The last thing it says, it sent an SSH uh, key there. Exchange is a key exchange. It was expecting one back. Now, if I go look at it, I will go actually see. I'm not going to take the time right now because we're going to run out of time today, so we don't run out of time. If I do TCP dump on these things, I would see packets on port 22 going back and forth. In fact, we can verify that. If things don't work, really one of the first things we should do is to do a neutron. And how many times have you ever done this? You try to ping something, and it's because uh, because you forgot to uh, you forgot to open a security group rule. So let's see if we got our security group. Let's see if we got have all our security group rules. Uh, yeah, thank you. You're you all were trying to tell me I can't type, and that's right. Okay, let's try that. I I confess to that. And if we look at this, we can look in here. You can see that there's an ICMP rule in there that's ingress. And you can also see that there should be, an, at the very bottom rule, is an ingress rule for port 22. So whatever's going on with SSH, it's not a security group rule. Well, it turns out that we're using, uh, when I'm doing something, that I'm connecting the two boxes with a VXLAN interface, but my OVS are talking to each other with GRE. So I'm running GRE inside VXLAN talking to two. So now, we talked about encapsulation and packet header sizes. One of the things that SSH doesn't like is that when it starts its key exchange, it will not allow you to fragment packets on that key exchange. Bad things happen. In fact, it does exactly this. It sits there and hangs. And let me show you something. Here's another troubleshooting technique that you can use. Let's go back up into this ping that we ran here. And there's another flag here. Let's do a dash C of two, so we do a count. There's a dash S, and let me set the size at 1450. Let's set the packet size. What that says is now ping is going to pack, pad the normal ping packet with enough extra data in there, so it's a, bit, a packet at 1450. Oops. We've got a problem. Those aren't getting through, but we already saw that if I take that size off and bring the size down to just a normal ping packet, that goes through just fine. I think we found the problem. We have an MTU problem. This is a classic MTU problem that you can run into in uh, Neutron. So let's go back up to size. Let's cut the packet size down to, let's try, let's do, let's try 1400. Remember, I got GRE inside. OVS, so 1400 is still too big. We need to figure out what size we can get through there. So let's try um, 1380. Let's see if that goes through. And sure enough, 1380 lets us go through. And it turns out, and why we have that going on is that we have 50 bytes of VXLAN header and uh, several bytes of GRE header. And I know if you look at it, people say it ranges anything from 24 to bigger. Um, if you figure it, really, if I look at it as about 64 bytes of GRE plus 50 bytes, that brings me down to about 1386. So I bet if I go to like 1384, we'll go through, and 1386, I bet doesn't. Let's just experiment with that. 1384, those don't go. So it's somewhere in there, but we know 1380 did. 1382 might go through, may or may not. They don't go through but we see 1380 does. So all these header packets wrap a, make it too big. So we have our SSH problem here because we're not setting the MTU down on our VM. So open vSwitch, go ahead. Is there a reason why you were uh, decrementing the value by two? I just, just, just cause I was, I couldn't remember exactly where the, where, where it worked and didn't, I've done this before, but I couldn't remember. I knew it was somewhere around there, so I was just picking some numbers just to, just to play with it. I could have done one. I mean, it'll take odd numbers. I mean, it, it just... 
I probably should have gone down a little further and gotten there quicker. Okay, it turns out that we can set something in the DHCP. If I, do a, if I look at my Etsy uh, Neutron, my DHCP config file, I want to put DC, DHCP agent. If I page down into this thing, I can set something in here. And let's see here if I can find where I set it. No, it's not by here. Ah, see this line right here? It says DNS mask config file. We're using DNS mask as our uh, DHCP server in Neutrons. Typically, there are some others you can use, but the default one is to use that. In this case, I set a parameter so that the DNS mask config file is specified. <clears throat> now, if I go look at that file, Let's go look at that. Go look at that. You can see as a DNS option force, the 26 is the first and the, and the second number is my MTU. Well, it was set to give my VM of MTU of 1500 bytes. And we already shown that 1500 ain't gonna work, cut it, is it? So let's go ahead and edit that. And I'm gonna come up in here and we already saw that 1380 was the magic number, so let's go 1380. That's that. Set that. Now to, now to fix this, we need to do a restart a Neutron DHCP agent. So now the, now the DHCP agent will reset and configure that. So now let's go back to my VM and do an IF down. And he's zero because I need to go get a DHCP again so that I get my MTU set properly because you can, you can see what my MTU was before. It was at 1,500. So let's do an if up. And then do an IPA. And notice what that now tells me that my MTU is. It's 1,380. Okay, so let's come back in here. and get out of where I did my SSH here. And I'll take out that dash V. And sure enough, there I get my key, so I can say yes, and I can do a Cubs win, smiley face. Uh, what did I do wrong? I typed it wrong. I'm not, I can't type some days. And sure enough, I'm into my VM. Now my day and my boss will be much happier with me today, right? Yeah, I spent all last night troubleshooting some of these type problems. So uh, I've been through this. This is the type of problem. I, hey, I've seen the, you know, the comments and the things. We've all been there. We've all spent hours trying to get our OpenStack installed. Our VMs didn't get IPs or our networks didn't. Hopefully right here we've seen some ideas and some th things with some tools that you can use to go troubleshoot your environments. Um, any questions on this thing? These, these are things, that, you know, basically, you've got to understand we have plumbing, and we have tools that allow us to look at the plumbing. Some allow us, if you please, like the thing, the, the camera that go down inside the plumbing. I'll get you just a second here. Uh, some of us allow us to go around it, and we have to think about our tools Along with that, not jump onto a conclusion fast enough until we've got enough evidence to find out what was going on. I've also been culprit of that many, many times where I see something and I think I know what the problem is and start tweaking things. And oh, that didn't fix it. And I tweak another thing. And in about 30, second, about 30 minutes, I've tweaked so many knobs, I can't ever get it back. And I've now I've thoroughly broke it. So uh, what could have been an hour or two job becomes a three day job to get things back up and running. I mean, we've all been there. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I, I thought yeah, if you're doing just VXLAN, uh, in fact, Neutron will typically do that for you. If you're using VXLAN, it'll set the MTUs to 1450. But in this case, I'm, I'm playing, I, I've played a little games in the way I built these machines. Normally, I would have separate interfaces. The, this is built just like uh, if we could run these in the cloud. They don't like, 
the cloud doesn't like us to run some of the types of packets. So I, I hide everything inside of VXLAN, and then I do my Neutron inside that so that the cloud doesn't get all upset and start blocking things that I try doing. Uh, and so that's, that's why this is constructed that funny way. But it also allows me to do also a little more work in showing what MTU issues can happen inside it. Because if you use VXLAN tunnels, if you use GRE tunnels, I will guarantee you, you're going to run into MTU problems in your world. And you've got you to know how to troubleshoot what to look for and then how to get it. There's another question. Go ahead. Why was it down? I put it down. I did that. I did that ahead of time. That, that was a setup in this case. But I've had situations like that happen where the interface has been broke somehow. I thought everything was working, and something went down in my data path. And that was, it was just to simulate a, a real-life scenario of stuff I've run into in the past. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. If you're doing load balancers as a service, yeah, yeah you, you can, and the same, it's the same, it's the same, right? same technology. In this case, if you're doing load balancer as a service, we realize that now things are stuck inside a load balancer namespace, so I may have to troubleshoot inside there. But again, TCP dump is your friend, because it's, if you know what packets need to be going on, that's why I say understanding what actually is going on in your network, what type of packets you should be seeing. That's also why having your laptop with a couple of VMs and a working little OpenStack environment means then I can go simulate and see what type of traffic I should see. And then I can go into the broke case and see what kind of traffic I'm seeing. Yeah, so, so I really, you know, I strongly recommend that you keep a couple of VMs around uh, that allow you to do at least a simple OpenStack and you can bring up, because if you get into a problem where things aren't working, if you now can compare and see what works and what it should like when it works, what it should look like when it works, yeah, you, ha you have a yes and a no case. You can compare, so now you can have a better chance of troubleshooting it. So really, that's a thing. Go ahead, and I'll get you next. Uh, should we approach the problem of no internet connection at the VM in the same way, or there are other tips that you can give? Are uh, there other tips? Really? Uh, I'm assuming that the, the VM has IP and there is no down interface. Uh, in this case... The, the tips I gave you, the techniques I, I typically use are exactly what I've done here. Is I start using TCP dump and looking at what's happening. Because I need to see what's going on in the packets. What packets are going where? I, I, since I've done this enough, I know what I should see. So, but, and that's where some experience will help you. But it's just, in the end, I don't know of any shortcut way of, other than to just, Follow the packet, you know, it's the guy with the little sh sh the, uh, piece under the walnut shells and mixing them around. We're trying to look under all the walnut shells and figure out which one has got the packet. And, you know, you get, just have to, you have to follow the packet around. So following it around until you, it's, it disappears. Something, you know, you can see it coming out. We can see it coming out, and we we're just following it around. Now, typically, I would have gone about this a different way. I wouldn't have, since I broke that and knew where it was broke, I didn't jump straight on that. Typically, I would have gone and looked at the packet as it immediately came into my network node to make sure it's getting on my network node. I went inside the network namespace because I didn't want to jump on the, the answer too quick. But, but I would have gone that way. Typically, typically, I'll just go step by step as that packet goes to the network, and at some point, I'll, I'll lose the packet. And then I know... Okay, what's what's broke in that area? Yeah, one more, one more. Okay. Yeah, we didn't check any IP tables root during this hands-on session. So, uh, but for but for the, for example, internet connection problem, should we also be checking uh, those type of things, or should we in ge in general, I haven't had too many problems with IP table rules, but yes, they're there. Uh, and by the way, I've got a couple of questions here. I'll get to them. One thing too, there's two wonderful flags uh, that are useful in IP table rules that we can use. And let me show you real quick here the difference in output, because I think this, uh, let me go over here and show you. 
Let's go back on that control, a compute node. If I do an IP, IP tables dash L, if you look at that, you see all these wonderful rules that jump up there. If I do a dash, dash V option, notice what V gives me. You see, I now have two things called bytes and packets. Those are real helpful. And there's one other one, dash dash line numbers can be helpful. But the dash V option is really important because that will give me, I can go through there. If you look at this one, this rule right here said that I had 265 packets or 6,700 bytes. I can see which rules are being hit, you know, the packets are being going through which rules. So using that dash V option is really helpful. It's one of the things we forget. And I, I forget and then all of a sudden, about the time I get into it, I go, why didn't I do that? And then I go back and do it, but it'll help. So question. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. In the case of Neutron, you've got to set up to use network namespaces. Don't try to. Use, don't try. The thing is, if you try using Neutron without network namespaces, then you have to make sure that your client addresses are all separate from anything else, and you can. All, you're going to have to tell your clients what exact address ranges they can use, and they can't be any addresses that are on any of your machines or any place else. And so you really. You, you don't want to run Neutron without using network namespaces. So, so we do use network namespaces, okay. but the point here is that uh, uh, when I use IP, your NetNS command, EXCC, and then I give the QHDCP, the, the namespace, and then I give SSH, and use a floating IP address, it works fine, but without using the network namespaces, when I go to another host and try to SSH or ping into the VM using a floating IP address, it doesn't work. Okay, I'd have to, let's talk about afterwards when we get a little more deeply what's going on there and talk about that. VXLAN or GRE, I don't have a preference, although I've seen that of late, I see some of the uh, uh, networking companies, at least in the Neutron world, push VXLAN over GRE. And so I, I see them wanting to, do, you know, right now, it, inside the software de uh, defined network space, now it's one thing out into the, as we go into the backplane world, there, those folks are pushing GRE in that world. But in the SDN space, I see that uh, VXLAN is being pushed more heavily. Uh, but but I, from everything I see network performance-wise, there's probably little difference. The bigger issue is that you need to make sure your NIC cards support the technology so you can offload that onto your NIC card as opposed to your host CPU doing that. So, and, and some of the newer NIC, there's a number of newer NIC cards that support that so that you can, you don't have to do it into uh, CPU space, you can do it in, in your NIC card space. And that's what you'd really prefer. So technically there, there are no differences? Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying there's not any differences, but I'm saying that uh, from what I can see, they both, they both work adequately. The big difference is I think GRE has the ability to do maybe up to four gig worth of networks, whereas uh, VXLAN only has 16 million, but I haven't seen anybody with a environment that 16 million is a problem. So um, I think the bigger thing is what does your backbone people care about and your, the NIC cards that you're going to use on your compute nodes, what do they support? That would be the deciding factors. Well, but yeah, VXLAN uses UDP, that's correct. Uh, but you see, since your packets are all in, uh, typically TCP, if you care about it, you're in your actual packet's using TCP, so it will resend it if it needs to. So you don't, you don't need the uh, inherent technology. And I guess that could mean that, in theory, VXLAN might be a little faster since it's going through the UDP portion of the stack instead of the TCP portion of the stack. I, in practice, I haven't seen any difference between the two, but it, it depends on the, you know, what TCP, if which path you're talking about, right? Control path would use TCP, then and then the other path would go with the expand UDP. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, you know, again, I see the the 
networking folks of the world, the Cisco's, the Brocades, and some of those seem to be uh, preferring uh, VXLAN over GRE tunnels. Uh, I haven't had anybody say why, but I just see that's what's going on. I can tell you why. Okay. Okay, cool, and good. And you get into another thing that people don't think about enough when they're building clouds is making sure that they have sufficient entropy for their VMs. Because when you run out of entropy for your VMs, you pre create another problem in that now your packet sequence numbers can become predictable and can cause other issues. So uh, when you design your cloud, you need to think about it. The uh, OpenStack security manual talks a little bit about that. Uh, but making sure you have sufficient entropy on each of your compute nodes is it. Yeah. yeah. One last question, then we're going to have to call it quits for today. Uh, well, you know, you could go to jumble frames. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, run, I find the fact in our data centers, our backbone people say no jumble frames. You go ask them, please, I want, no. The answer is always no. So <laughs> in my world is I have to dial down. Now, now, if the world of your data center, your backbone people allow you to do jumble frames, that would be a perfectly acceptable. And actually, it's some preference to do that because if I can run my inner size packet at 1500 byte MTU, obviously fewer packets and a little more efficiency. So yeah. Okay, I appreciate everybody's time here. If you have any other questions, I'll be hanging around a little bit afterwards. I'll try to answer questions. Um, out of that, appreciate your time and sorry we didn't get time to do hands on, but the network was up and down earlier and we've had some real serious problems and you'll never get this done. Okay.